This is the last place to call the cops, especially when you have a paranoid paper boy as a nephew. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. We're talking Atlanta season four, episode four, light skin did it. <laughs> This episode on first watch, halfway through, I'm like, it's a three out of five for me. But by the end of the episode, I gave it five out of five. On second watch, if I could, I would give it a six. For all of you guys who hated season three for the anthologies, those one-offs, they made up for all of that with this one episode. Let me know what you thought of it down below and let's get into this plot recap. The episode opens up with Ern sitting outside the house, which is such a callback to season one, episode one, when they wouldn't let him in because he cost too much. And then that tied into season four, episode two, when we find out in therapy that he borrowed money for a suit he never wore, for an interview he never went to. I wonder if he paid his parents back by now. You know we're going to get into a lot of things in this episode because she's got her glasses on. <laughs> I started laughing when Gloria, his mom, comes out and instantly gives him a backhanded compliment. Why do black parents got to do that? You got to roast him for his hair looking good but wanting to set a match to it last time. Dad walks by and he asks, how's retirement? He seems to be in a rush. And he says, it's good. And then he asks his mom, isn't dad coming? You already know what type of time it is if the episode's starting this way. Now they're on their way and Ern is hungry. And everything about this scene is Ern being in a childlike state even though he's grown. Tell me if you relate, but no matter how old you get, if you're around your parents and elders, them aunties and uncles, you just retreat to your child state. He asks to get some food and she says, we don't have time for that. I'm thinking if she's a typical church lady, she's gonna get there early because she wants to talk to people at the front and pick her favorite seat in the pew. You probably have time to pop through a drive-through, but no, she's gotta pick up Aunt Jeannie and Grandpa. I'm gonna let you guys know why initially this was a three out of five. I was triggered. There was things that were too relatable and too true to life that I was just sitting there in my feelings but once i got over and i got a couple laughs i was like this is classic atlanta quintessential it's just perfection there's a moment when Ern is in the car and he's kind of thinking to himself you can tell from his facial expression do i even want to ask my mom because she's starting to say something but i don't really want to know don't go down there whenever there's family drama i don't want to be in the mix of it so whenever that moment of hesitation comes i go to the left i don't have time for that but he takes the bait and Laura lets him know that Aunt Jeannie has been keeping their dad away from her. There's some kind of animosity in the family. And she says all these other things that I'm thinking, are they true or are you just trying to cast her in a bad light? Even when Aunt Jeannie got in the car and then he asked again to get food and she offers him a cough drop, I was like, oh, she seems sweet. After that, I had no love for Aunt Jeannie. She comes for his neck. I don't know if I can get through this without laughing. It's the holier than thou energy for me. When she said, it's a shame that you have a beautiful woman like Van living in sin. I said, only, only Aunt Jeannie. The tension in that car, Ern was feeling trapped and as the audience, so were we. It was so claustrophobic in there. Before Aunt Jeannie got in the car at Grandpa, Gloria let Ern know that she's planning on stealing her dad. Where they do that at? It wasn't missed on me when both Aunt Jeannie and Ern get out of the car and there's this split second where Ern looks back at his mom like, don't do that. And she, of course, skirt, skirt, pulls off so dramatically away from the church, leaving them behind. They go inside the church, mimes at the front. I was like, is this a real thing? A Google search let me know it is. I had never been to a church like that. I was trying to look in the back to see if the kid from season one that was in the back of Van's class with the white face on was performing. Because who knows? Maybe there's a tie-in with that. For all we know... He could have just kept the face on from the day before and it was a Monday class. Stranger things have happened in the Atlanta universe. Either way, it reminded me of that episode. Ern's body language was so stiff and rigid as Aunt Jeannie's questioning what's going on. Ern excuses himself to go to the washroom where he looks up at a black Jesus. I'm thinking if Jesus was black, he wouldn't look like that. <laughs> okay, okay. He calls his one lifeline, his dad, who wants no part of the mess. He says, for 30 years, I want a three hour break once a week. Wait, the math is not mathing. Ern is definitely older than 30. We're not gonna get into that. I love that his dad leaves him hanging while he's getting his shoe shine. And Ern looks up and decides he's gonna sneak out. Did you guys pick up that the passage or the message of the week was about defeat? I thought that was perfect for what happens to all the characters in this episode. 
This tied into a thought I wanted to share with you. Do you think this is a commentary on the culture as far as church? People will dress up in their best, their Sunday best, go sit in service for three hours to not take the message and apply it to their life the rest of the week. What is the point of having a religion, spirituality, or even just a philosophy for your life that you don't actually live by? And when you look at the actions of all the characters in this episode, they could have used listening to that message and applying it. Edit point, something in my spirit said to pull that scene right back up. Good thing I did, because I heard it wrong. It's John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, destroy, and kill. So maybe the message was only meant for one in this episode, Gloria. The idea of sitting through the message that's meant for you on church and applying it every other day still stands. So of course, Ern thought he was slick with it, but Auntie was sitting in the cut. She comes up and says the criminal minds line. I laughed a little bit thinking of everyone who's ever watched one of those crime shows and thinks they're suddenly FBI. Then Atlanta does what it's done in many other episodes before, which is that back and forth where Ern looks at Auntie says so, she says so, she, he says so enough times for you to know that she's going to go to the studio. So they pull up on the studio, but, 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 but before that, we see Paperboy playing with Gunna, which this must have been filmed a while ago because the hot water that Gunna's in with the Rigo case, he ain't got time to play games, literally and figuratively. But Gunna is playing Uno and losing to Paperboy, who's feeling himself. He says the line, you know, you got to learn to play the game. I thought that was a call back to when he was playing... <laughs> in the millionaire's house with the nandos and how he thought he was playing the game but he got played i think it's also a callback to last episode and when he tries to be a manager and has newfound respect for earn he realizes certain things about the business you can see that his character arch is developing and understanding more about the business as well as his personal life i love how they were able to show that shift and that growth in three sentences in a scene what also stuck out to me and maybe i'm doing the most with this and Jeannie was wearing a yellow shirt. She's yellow bone. The yellow card was the privileged card that made him win against Gunna. There's a lot of privileged energy in the scene. And then when Jeannie comes in with all the smoke and the heat, and everyone gets to get, <laughs> everyone has to clear out because it's a family emergency. She had to compliment Gunna's earrings on the way out though. Aunties are like that. <laughs> This part was the most hilarious to me in the entire episode when Paperboy blurts out everything and Ernst just and then I laughed again when both of the cousins sat down on the couch simultaneously and had their head in their hand as if like, why are we going through this or not this again? And it reminded me so much of my family. I can't put out my family business. I was triggered most of the way through, especially when she put everyone on the line. She called Willie, called Gloria, called Pearl to tell them what's going on. And then she started to get aggressive with it and saying, none of you guys like me, you hate me. When they all said why simultaneously, I laughed. And then I laughed even harder when they laughed at her, Savage. But then she went way overboard. I mean, <laughs> when Willie says, it's not because you're light skinned, you're evil. I laughed at that, but I thought maybe she is because the way she came for Gloria afterwards, that was a dagger that went too deep. On another note, I was wondering what was Willie frying up? Not that alligator. There was so much in that conversation, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. But the thing that stood out to me the most was when Willie said, He's old, he's gonna forget things once or twice. I thought, is it true? Is it that the aunties are exaggerating the mental state of grandpa? Or is this what happens in the culture where people downplay what someone's going through or they don't realize a diagnosis until it progresses to a more degenerative state? That happens all the time. You guys know about my story as I've gone through being <laughs> legally blind. It could go both ways. It could be an illustration of how some are in denial about degenerative diseases. It could be that in the culture, we don't take mental health as health the way we would with the rest of our body. Or it could be that everyone else is blowing it up out of proportion and grandpa just maybe forgets things from time to time. Or it could be that he's in early stages of dementia and you can't really say for sure. All we do know is when the cops come, which... <laughs> When Paperboy put up his hand to say, don't do that. I said, Auntie, read the room. This is the last place to call the cops. Especially when you have a paranoid Paperboy as a nephew, don't do that. But of course, aunties do what aunties do. Aunt Jeannie decided to call the police, explain the case. They seemed like they weren't really, well, I mean, anyway. <laughs> I was crying when they told Ern to call his mom and put grandpa on the phone. Grandpa was doing well with the wellness check until he got to Egypt. <laughs> I also thought when he said, yes, I know I'm with my daughter. He didn't say his daughter's name, so maybe he knows it's his daughter and his dementia is not so far gone. 
And that kind of made me feel sad for a second. Then the next scene we see is Aunt Jeannie still going off outside the studio. A receptionist comes up to Paperboy and Earn as he says, I don't want to be like this. To me, that signified that therapy really is working. He's realizing he doesn't want to be like his parents and aunties and uncles. That's something he wants to leave in the past. When the receptionist said you can go through the Bobby Schmurda exit, why you gotta throw Bobby Schmurda in there like that? Especially the line about how it didn't help him with his court case or the two baby mamas. They look at the exit and they say, she's gonna see us. That's when the receptionist says, don't look back. And I instantly thought church, the theme, it's Sodom and Gomaya. So just don't look back so you don't become a pillar of salt. There was a moment when the two cousins are walking in unison and they kind of, kind of turn. I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. Because we know Atlanta can get supernatural. Luckily, they keep their pace, slowly walk away while you can hear Auntie Jeannie still complaining in the back. I think that symbolized that whatever the path is, however the season ends at this stage, both Al and Ern have the awareness to know they don't want to be like their elders. There's so much to be said in this episode about generational differences and dissonance, how we don't have to carry on some of the thought patterns and beliefs that we've been raised to understand or replicate. In that short scene, I saw so much being said about seeing, observing, and deciding to do different. And in a way, seeing how these two characters started the journey with us in season one with that off energy and where they are now, it's it's coming to a full circle moment. But the way they were walking though, I was just like, this is so extra. The next scene we see in this plot line is they're all at dinner. They're about to get to the bill. I don't know if Earn offered to pay because something was mentioned about the MasterCard being at its limit because dad's spending. And that's when I realized, oh, we'll talk about it more when we get to dad's plot line. They asked for bread and the bill and they kept telling the boy to come back. And, you know, I worked in the restaurant industry, so I felt triggered during this scene because I'm thinking the bread is gratis. It's complimentary. It's at the beginning of the meal. It's not something you necessarily take away. I personally won't fight anyone over it because I ain't got time for that. The boy just wanted to ask his manager. That's when Gloria gave him a hard time. Oh, you forgot the bread at the beginning but you just said you were full. Why do you need to take the bread home? I'm sure you have bread at home. Why you gotta be like that? That's another thing about generations. I've noticed, and let me know if you feel the same, but older generations, like my great grandma, if something is free, even though she doesn't need it, she wants it. Whereas I'm like the impact on the environment. If I take it, they're gonna have another one for another person. So if I don't need it, I don't wanna take it. No, older people to me, to me, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but older people seem to be of the mindset of, if it's free, I want it. It doesn't matter if I need it, it's the principle of it. So this back and forth got to me a little bit. We know if you felt irritated too, especially when Rayleigh slammed his hand on the table, everyone looked around, he's like, just get that red. I was like, wow, that smoke was not meant for that poor boy. And that's how the episode ends. Wrapping up with Rayleigh's plot line. At first, I'm like, why are we watching this? What's going on? But I loved it by the end. When he pulls up to the empty parking lot, it's desolate. They go into a close shot of his feet while he's on the phone talking about vacation pay to someone. It doesn't sound like he's retired much. The way he was talking sounded like he was working on the lows or is recently retired and doesn't know how to check out in that way. He lets the person on the line know he's gonna get a phone today with night vision. The generational theme is there. I don't know anything that's called night vision, so I don't know if he thinks it's something else and is calling it that, because a lot of my elders do that or if it's some new feature that's not really new to him, because when I got my last update this week, there was no night vision on there. <laughs> As he's walking through the mall, he puts up the hand, no thank you, he's moving with the slickness, it's giving Rabbit and Alice in Wonderland, I'm late, I'm late, I'm very, very late energy. And then there's this one lady who's the picture of perfection when it comes to sales, who says, you know, you're too smart for this, but you know, only certain people can wear hats. Can I just, bar you for a couple minutes. It's not, you don't need to buy anything. That's how they always get you. That's how they rope you in. Next thing you know, she's saying, do you want to try two on again? I'm thinking the one he's wearing actually looks good for his head. So she wasn't wrong with the compliment she was throwing in. And as you're watching this scene, he's glowing. He's effervescent. The actor did such a good job of expressing this very subtle human reaction of when you're boosted and your confidence is coming through. Then she says, I have this one hat. I'm not supposed to bring it out yet. He says, don't, don't go through the trouble. I said, the only trouble is that you're getting scammed and swindled and she's finessing you. He brings out this hat. And I'm like, uh-uh, that ain't the one. That's doing too much. Keep number three, trust me. 
But next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, he's wearing this hat, strutting his stuff, feeling himself. He hears some noise. He looks down, and there's those big toy cars, not where they're supposed to be pandemonium in the mall. He rushes, he tries to cut through a food court where this kid who reminds me of Zan from season one gives him a hard time. I hated this because it was a sandwich where he roasted him, compared him to Prince, if Prince didn't die, I said that's disrespectful. Then gone on his knees to beg to take a picture. Then when Raylene's looking off at the corner, looking defeated, ego crushed and crumbled. He says, I'm gonna go viral from this. Ah, this is either the third or fourth moment that also demonstrated the difference in generations. It also made me think of what happened this week with DJ Academics. If you know, you know, if you don't, what happened was DJ Academics decided to fix himself to say that the forefathers of hip hop are old and dusty. Then LL Cool J has shared a couple words with him. With this episode and with that real life current problem, there's this conversation about generational differences, respect, seeing what has come before. I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking, why are you disrespecting this old man? Maybe his hat is not your style, but let him be. He's already not in a good mood because he's late. And as we find he's spending money, he has no business spending. It was so sad to see this man who's simply trying to enjoy his three hours away from his mix up, getting roasted by this kid who wants to go viral. So contrasting. So by the time we get to dinner, now we see why he's so frustrated, but he really shouldn't have taken it out on that kid. I didn't realize why he was so pressed for time until that comment at dinner. And I was like, oh, that's why he was rushing through. He didn't want to be tempted, which also speaks into vices. That's how I saw it. Let me know how you saw it. Also, let me know down below if there's anything I missed because you know how it goes. Life leaves you blind. Sometimes I don't see things. Thanks as always for making it to the end of this one. If you haven't already, thumbs up and subscribe. And until next week, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.